Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the investor call of Signity Technologies Limited to discuss the Q4 and FY22 results. Today we have with us from the management, Mr. Shrikant Chakilam, Chief Executive Officer and Non-Executive Director, Mr. Krishnan Venkatachari, Chief Financial Officer, Mr. Vinay Rawat, Chief Revenue Officer, Mr. Sairam Prabhu Vedam, Chief Marketing Officer, Mr. Raghuram K, President and Global Delivery Head. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star 10 zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Schneider from AdFactors PR. Thank you and over to you, sir. Thanks, Margaret. Before the call, we would like to point out that certain statements made in today's call may be forward-looking in nature and a disclaimer to this effect has been included in the earnings presentation shared with you earlier. The investor call may contain forward-looking statements based on the currently held beliefs and assumptions of the management of the company, which are expressed in good faith and, in their opinion, reasonable. Forward-looking statements involve known and unknown risks, uncertainties, and other factors which may cause the actual results, financial condition, performance or achievements of the company, or industry results to differ materially from the results, financial condition, performance, or achievements expressed or implied by such forward-looking statements. The risks and uncertainties relating to these statements include but are not limited to risks and risks of expansion plans, benefits from fluctuations in our earnings, our ability to manage growth and implement strategies, competition in our business, including those factors which may affect our cost advantage, wage increases in India, our ability to attract and retain highly skilled professionals, and our ability to win new contracts, changes in technology, availability of financing, our ability to successfully compete and integrate our expansion plan, liabilities, political instability, and general economic conditions affecting our industry. Unless otherwise indicated, the information contained herein is preliminary indicative and is based on the management's information, current plans, and estimates. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Srikant Chakilam for his opening remarks. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Snyder. Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Q4 earnings call of Signity. For this year, we've had, uh, uh, for the previous quarter, we've had 5.7% uh, growth, uh, and the revenue we've done is about uh, 325.46 crores in comparison to Q3. And for the year, we've had a stupendous amount of growth, uh, growth close to 38%. That includes many enterprise and fortune clients. The growth also includes uh, several digital opportunities in areas beyond quality engineering. Although the company initially planned for growth that included both organic and inorganic uh, growth, we've been able to pull this off uh, through uh, largely organic growth and solely organic growth uh, through investments into sales, marketing, and delivery. The year also saw expansion into newer areas and geographies, uh, change in leadership, and also addition to the management team in line with the aspiration of the company's vision. We've been firm with our plans to graduate into a digital assurance and engineering services company, a market that is now valued at $300 billion, and the digital product development market being far bigger than this. This market offers an explosive headroom for growth for companies which have strong capabilities in data, analytics, AI, ML, and cloud-based engineering. If you look at the global 2,000 companies, they have been partnering and continue to partner with service providers who can help with the, with the capabilities that I just mentioned. The global AI market is expected to grow at 38% from 2022 to 2030, 
and the continuous research and innovation directed by uh, the large big tech companies are uh, driving adoption of advanced technologies and continue to promote produce uh, humongous amounts of data every second which calls for data engineering services and specialists leading into data first digital transformation so in line with this thought process and to leverage our existing client base of more than 200 plus clients along with many fortune 500 clients we propose the acquisition of apara digital private limited uh, known as round square known as brand known under the brand name of round square uh, and this was approved by the board for an all cash deal of 4.8 million, million dollars. We believe the synergies between Round Square and its active learning AIBS platform and Signity's depth in its services and relation with its clients will further influence business outcomes for our clients and help become a strategic partner through a data first digital transformation approach. Coming to profitability, the EBITDA reported for the quarter stood at 32.6 crores and for the year stood at 129 crores. We are optimistic as a company about evening out the costs through multiple measures that have already been identified and bring in a healthy balance of growth and profit in the days to come. I will now hand over the uh, floor to Krishnan to talk about uh, financial research. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, uh, thanks for attending the uh, call. Uh, uh, the year has been a breakout year. Uh, uh, we have done a growth in terms of, as uh, uh, Shikant uh, mentioned, that we have done a top-line growth of about 38%. Just taking a step back into the last uh, uh, four or five years is that 2017 to 20 has been a year where we try to do a sustainable uh, 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 revenue model in terms of growing at an average at about 8% and trying to concentrate on lesser clients and consolidating the clients from about 450 to 250 clients. We have been successful in retaining that and increasing the wallet share while uh, uh, the uh, EBITDA has been stabilized or so stabilizing at about 15%. I think the pandemic uh, gave us a food for thought and also gave us uh, a clear uh, direction that uh, we as a company need to de-risk uh, various other measures. And that is one of the reasons we did start investing about 18 months back in terms of uh, investing in center of uh, excellence, creating uh, uh, offerings in terms of uh, reaching out to uh, other key verticals, which helped us to support and sustain the revenue during the pandemic. And the cost savings and the cost optimization measures, which was there in terms of a nominal salary reduction and then non-travel and things like that led us to a 16% EBITDA last year on a comparable normalized basis, which could have been at about close to 14%. But I think the year gave us uh, that kind of, those kind of investments what has made and continued uh, the investment during the current year, which was necessitated and which has resulted in a, a lower EBITDA, which is uh, close to about 11% comparing to what it was the previous year. But I think uh, our growth engine is ticked in very clearly. What was originally planned in our 500 million journey to have both organic and inorganic and the year, we could have grown at about 20, 25% with the rest which were planned through inorganic has been supplemented completely out of organic growth. And uh, 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 we know for sure that uh, uh, we, uh, where we are accelerating and things like that. While it is so that I think the differential 4%, 5% EBITDA, which, is, uh, 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 which has been uh, uh, predominantly on account of one, we have reinvested back into the business in terms of sales and marketing, in terms of bringing in a bit stability and trying to get the visibility with respect to partners, which will uh, start yielding results, which contributed about close to 2% of the revenue. And uh, we did invest on people, which is about close to 1.5% of the revenue, which was uh, on account of the labor turnover being at about 31%. We just did... Uh, uh, some corrections in the midway through in October, November, which was necessitated, and uh, we have seen the effect of it probably. Uh, the <coughs> attrition rates have come down from 31 to 29. While it is so, there has been one time cost in the GNA, which is equivalent to about 1.5%, which for sure doesn't get, uh, will get reversed in the current year in terms of uh, not recurring. So we are pretty confident net net that differential 3.5% is a justified cost, and which we are trying to monitor, optimize, and see what best can be done. This is a summary in terms where we are uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, full-blown taxation and uh, what we have delivered out. While it is so, I think uh, uh, the North America continues to be my leader, to contributing about close to 89%, and uh, the rest of the world contributing about uh, the balanced uh, share of the business. The revenue mix is always healthy that uh, we have uh, made a uh, paradigm shift, and my offshore is contributing about 49% and 51% from on-site, while the dollar rate for the quarter has uh, uh, increased uh, marginally on the offshore front and also by about half a dollar and on, on site. Overall, year over year, we have increased by about close to uh, $4 in terms of the on site rate. 
the new client added during the quarter is about 18 and the number of clients active is about close to 231 and the top 20 clients continue to dominate my show in terms of contributing uh, uh, a combination of about uh, uh, 33% or 50% in terms of the revenue 33% in terms of the uh, uh, sorry 33% in terms of the revenue comparing 29% what it was in the last year and uh, uh, there has been uh, uh, a tremendous increase in terms of the utilization we have uh, in spite of the pandemic in spite of uh, working from uh, uh, home model i think we have been very successful in terms of not losing out any client on account of delivery issues or capability issues we still have done a utilization on site at about 96.4% and off, uh, offshore at about 83.5% uh, 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 overall uh, uh, basis uh, which uh, sorry uh, uh, or yeah, on overall base. Uh, the, in terms of the sectors, probably the BFSI continue to dominate in terms of about 19% and then followed travel and hospitality has bounced back at about 16.5% and retail and commerce at about close to 15% continue to be the uh, dominant uh, 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 sectors contributing. While this year necessitated to net addition of about close to 600 plus employees, which was uh, uh, which has also made us to spend some amount in terms of the capex which has uh, uh, definitely uh, uh, impacted a little bit on the cash flow. While it is so, the receivables, we had to accommodate the customers in terms of uh, increasing the average receivables days, which you have seen probably would have noted, notably moved up by about close to 70 crores. That has really, uh, that is getting back to normalcy in terms of getting corrected uh, over the current quarter. And uh, that is one of the reasons probably the net cash generated from the system has uh, come down. The directors have recommended uh, to the shareholders in terms of a dividend of continuing dividends in spite of the margins being uh, uh, dipped uh, uh, comparing to last year uh, uh, with the confidence that yes, there are enough cash flows available and the company is confident of bouncing back. So the same amount of dividend has been uh, declared out uh, completely. And uh, uh, as uh, Shikant uh, uh, announced that uh, the board considered the proposal, which is uh, in terms of uh, picking up the company, which is on the digital foray, and uh, we are confident that uh, this company, which is currently uh, 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 running a, a revenue run rate at about 3 million for the last year closing, with an EBITDA close to about 18%, uh, uh, is likely to gallop in terms of the growth and then also do a cross-selling and upselling in terms of the current set of clients, what it is there. Overall, we are looking at a very, very positive uh, uh, note uh, to move forward. Uh, while it is so, uh, we would like to make a very clear statement that we are cautiously optimistic in terms of uh, improving the margins. We are trying to uh, monitor all the costs, optimize the best. While we have been uh, uh, euphoria, we have, there is euphoria in terms of the revenue growth, which we have achieved over a period of time in terms of the last 18 months, 24 months to the current 12 months. But I think we have also seen that the growth impacts the margin and then we would like to structure the growth out very systematically. And that is one of the reasons we have brought in a new CRO who is Vinay Rawat who will be just uh, giving us glimpses out uh, uh, next to me. And he's, uh, 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 he brings with him a lot of experience in the state experience in terms of uh, uh, <clears throat> winning large accounts and maintaining and leading and creating a stickiness with the client. Uh, with these few words, I will hand over the mic to Vinay, a few commentary in terms of the uh, uh, sales uh, uh, area. Thank you. Over to you, Vinay. Thanks, Krishnan. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Vinay Rawat. Uh, I'll give a quick introduction of mine. I joined uh, CPT about uh, three months back uh, after a long career uh, with Pipro, and after that, uh, a, a private equity-backed company, Infogain, and uh, I left Infogain after the successful exit to Apex Partners. Uh, I'll just give you a quick uh, uh, rundown on the market demand, which actually I see here. Uh, you know, from an overall uh, digital transformation perspective, the, the, the business transformation of enterprise actually continues. Though there is definitely a cautiously optimistic outlook, uh, and most enterprises, uh, you know, post-pandemic situation where they are actually tapering down, but nevertheless, because the digital business transformation uh, continues, their investment into these areas is something which is uh, continuing. We are seeing uh, a very reasonable demand which actually can continue to actually accelerate our growth uh, in our customer base. Uh, we are fo focusing more and actually are you know, kind of double dipping in our current customer base where uh, we will not only be uh, using our like, immediate acquisition, which Srikant just talked about, to expand our foot, 
uh, other other base in our uh, account to actually provide digital assurance and digital engineering services. But in addition to that, we will also use that to acquire newer clients. So our, our key growth uh, uh, go to market strategy is to actually focus on an existing account and uh, you know uh, make the like 20 million, 25 million dollar accounts like our top top accounts uh, to to that level. Uh, uh, overall, in our existing uh, customer base, we are seeing larger deals. Uh, the demand for digital assurance and digital engineering partners is something which is uh, very visible. Uh, it's a very competitive market, and therefore our positioning of being a digital assurance partner across the digital transmission journey is something very unique, and most customers actually have liked it. So far, all the customers whom I have met, they have been... Uh, they have been pretty happy with our overall execution story and our ability to provide uh, value uh, through this uh, digital assurance services to them. Um, so, uh, in Excel, I would say that uh, we are in a pretty uh, a pretty sweet space when it comes to niche provider. And uh, today, when digital transformation journey actually is happening at most of the customer places, they are looking for boutique and best of the breed providers and that that positioning is something which actually serves us really well. Um, I'll be happy to answer uh, more questions regarding uh, our uh, market and our uh, deal situation. I will also say that uh, in terms of focus, we are uh, focusing on in improving our uh, sales productivity. We are focusing on, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, expanding our footprint and increasing our relationship level in our existing account uh, to uh, to multiple uh, CXOs so that we can address uh, multiple budget centers within our uh, customer base. Um, Krishnan, over to you. Thank you. I will have a small commentary from our uh, Chief Marketing Officer, Sairam Vedam. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Krishnan, and thank you, Vinay. It's going to be very short. Uh, uh, just to substantiate what uh, Srikant, Krishnan, and Vinay spoke, uh, uh, I'm glad to update that uh, we as a company have been recognized as a digital assurance leader uh, a very, um, you know, a, a couple of months back. This is a pivotal moment considering our journey towards what we are as an organization. So Nelson Hall put us uh, with leadership positioning in both AI cognitive testing, quality engineering, and continuous testing. That strengthens our digital assurance positioning and also sets up at a firm footing to offer complementary digital engineering acquisition that we did so which in our viewpoint uh, uh, is the way forward for us. So that is something that I wanted to sort of uh, highlight. And it's our agility, ability, and adaptability, uh, which brings in this niche uh, differentiation that we continue to enjoy with our global 2,000 customers. And, and all that uh, goes to the delivery execution excellence, which I would leave to Raghu to give a few uh, initial comments. Thanks, Sarah. I think uh, good afternoon all. Um, I think in line with the vision of the company, which Srikant also mentioned at the beginning of the call, um, pivoting ourselves to uh, a digital assurance and engineering organization um, uh, from a delivery standpoint. Um, I'm happy to uh, let all of you know that we have invested a lot in this year to expand our capabilities, set up new technology centers of excellence, uh, set up new technology practices, uh, which cater to things beyond quality engineering and overlapping into the digital space. Uh, we have been able to attract a lot of top talent to ensure that we build that capability. We have resonated that with our existing clients. As uh, Vinay was alluding to, uh, we have got a lot of positive feedback, and we are working on maturing that practice to the next level. Uh, having said that, we are very, very optimistic that in the upcoming fiscal year, or in the fiscal year that we just started, uh, we will be able to bounce back on uh, the margins and uh, deliver value to our clients in the digital space. Over to you, Krishna. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I think now we can uh, we are open to take questions. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Anyone who would like to ask a question, please press star and one at this time. Ladies and gentlemen, 
We will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Ridesh Gandhi from Discovery Capital. Please go ahead. Hi, you know, hi. Just want to initially understand, you know, while almost on every quarterly call, we've been sort of indicating a revival in the margins and even in sort of often discussion. Just wanted to understand actually what is the reason why uh, there is a discrepancy between what we've been expecting to happen and what is actually uh, what is what is actually happening on the EBITDA, on the EBITDA margin side of things? I'd like to talk about the increase in reduction. Yeah. So uh, we um, we have uh, had uh, you know uh, the current uh, market scenario. Uh, we've had to uh, invest a lot into retention mechanisms. Uh, that is one. Secondly, we've had uh, a few uh, one-time sequences, uh, sequence of events with regards to uh, reversal of SCIS. And uh, yeah, so probably just adding to those points, probably, gentlemen, is that if you look at it, uh, if you look at the spread of the cost completely into the gross level in terms of the co uh, cost of goods sold, with respect to the gross margin, with respect to the sales, with respect to the uh, G&A. At a gross level, uh, we have definitely, if you, your question is very valid in terms of why you're not able to predict out things clearly, while we anticipated that the corrections what we made in November in terms of uh, sustaining the entire uh, critical delivery folks to the tune of about close to 500 people, including the non billable managers, which was necessitated for us to really go ahead and do a salary revision, while it is so, I think the resource available crunch was also made us in terms of higher cost, which was not an anticipated in terms of uh, uh, and we thought that that's a one-time exercise which we will be doing out while we predicted the market, but I think Janssen must continue its fate in terms of uh, milling losses. So we are we have to go one step forward to retain people and assure them and provide them the right kind of uh, mixes. So the market was going crazy. Yeah, but if I can just what if I can just actually push you slightly on this, what the initial discussion was was there was initially that we had actually 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 moved some amount of the like, contracts from the like, time based like, performance based contracts and we were expecting some of that recovery to happen in the future quarters this was about 2 to 2 3 quarters ago you know and yeah. then of course we had adjusted for effectively speaking increase in hike in pay and some of that you know so we aren't seeing that uptake happening because I understand a delay, obviously, in the time contracts as opposed to performance base. Uh, but we aren't seeing that uptick creeping, uh, creeping back in. And the other thing is that, you know, we've, we've had the call in the middle of last quarter when we had the conference call. And even there, we had indicated some amount of recovery. I'm sure in a span of a month and a half, not, I mean, that much has changed to impact the profit margins, right? Oh, yeah, I can put, uh, uh, thanks for your question. I think it's a valid question. I just, the, that's the reason I didn't conclude my statement. Uh, while Q1 to Q2, if you see on account of the uh, contracts being on the uh, time and material to uh, deliverable basis, the margins have increased from Q2 to Q3 as well. The uh, EBITDA moved up uh, uh, to 12, 12 and a half percent. If you see from 9 percent where we were in Q1, we have moved it up to 12 and a half percent. The full impact of the salary revisions, which we anticipated when we had in the call, we thought that we have concluded it in November, December. And uh, on January 30th, when we had a call with you all or whatever it is, that we thought that this is getting priced in. But however, Jan, Feb, March, we were necessitated to do a revisions for critical folks. Uh, which was essential because especially on the uh, digital side where we are performing, this was not anticipated as one thing. Second thing is for the newer contracts which has come through, we had to we had some fulfillment issues and we have resorted to contractors which came at a slightly higher cost to really hired contractors to fulfill that which was uh, even now the market is stupid and it is, uh, we expect that this tapering to happen probably in July, August in terms of what it is. As I speak to you probably, I'm concluding a revision in April, which is going to be effective April, going to be released out today, tomorrow, and which is going to be about 12.5% in terms of the overall cost and uh, 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 where, where we know that is the reason we are cautiously optimistic. While it is so, the second portion, which was not anticipated out very clearly, is that we are a few of the leaders uh, who exited out uh, on the sales side 
which made the sales uh, we need as the boat has to be strong uh, we have to necessarily move out definitely to arrest uh, the slide in the sales side to retain the revenue to move forward which necessitated an investment second we also did want to de-risk the business so we went ahead the it's a first quarter in the us probably the last quarter for us and for march we took a decision to really invest in the uh, partnership events very clearly as a committed cost which we need to commit that cost invariably so that we know that there is a channel of revenue which can come through through this relationship I, I understand that the business needs to be a bit more predictable in terms of what we are trying to do, but I think yes, as a process when we are trying to get through certain unpredictable events have really swept us away. Adding to that, I think some amount of cost which has gone into the legal side in Jan of March because on unethical practices we have proceeded and we have also filed it to the exchanges is that we we while we estimated some amount of cost after getting into the depth of it, the magnitude in terms of the analysis required was quite high, and hence. The multiples went up in terms of, for example, as against an 150,000, what we estimated it went to 600,000 dollars, kind of a thing, which we need to do out clearly. I think these uh, became a business dynamic in terms of an uh, unaccounted clearly. Those are the reasons we are trying to be more careful as we are budgeting and as we have presented a budget next yesterday to the board. We are trying to be much more careful in terms of trying to get to the predictability while. We have understood that the predictability cannot be 99 percent, but at least to an extent of about 90, 95 percent, we have tried to take up various things and then try to price in. We hope no, that we get no, it. Would be is that then what I'm saying is that even on this call, you are saying you are like cautiously optimistic, etc. My only advice is if there is lack of predictability, which that appears to be for the last three, four, five quarters in a row, then just don't provide any uh, guidance because because. Uh, you know, it it will. I mean, it'll work against us at the end of the day if we sort of keep providing these optimistic expectations and then you know, I, I actually I, I, uh, yeah, under delivering on those is my only advice. The other well, question, I take your, gentlemen, I take your advice very clearly. But as a company, I think uh, maybe uh, as a company we don't provide any kind of a guidance. But if you look at it as an optimism in life, generally I'm an optimistic person, and we as a company and anybody will operate on an optimal basis. So there is some amount of optimi optimi uh, optimism in the business very clearly when we deal in life. I can only say that uh, clearly is that as a company, we do not want, in fact, in the last call, conference call, opening remarks, Srikanth has made it clear, we expect the margin to be under pressure for the next two quarters where I have the recording as well very clearly. So we are really putting all our efforts to see that this kind of an optimism to ensure that we will try to bring that down. And yesterday, while and we have also used the word very clearly, cautiously optimistic is that is a way to keep our spirits up in terms of trying to move up clearly. We are doing we are doing our best. We understand that what you rightly said is that the predictability has to be uh, near perfect. We will correct ourselves and try to get to the predictability clearly. What we have also jotted down in terms of running it through as to where things have gone wrong. And we again, I'm telling you that. We are estimating and we hope that we'll be able to estimate and get things back to track. We are not giving any kind of a guidance in terms of what it is. Our 500 million journey and industry level at the end of the fifth year from 21, 2021 April reminds us a blueprint and we are trying to work towards it in terms of continuing to work towards it clearly. Well, so other than that, in terms of yearly question, guidance, we are not providing anything. Yeah. Well, the only other question is with, with regards to the buyback we are considering, Given you guys have already issued a, 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 a dividend right now, and uh, and a tender buyback is effectively a quasi dividend, are we looking at an open market buyback, or are we looking at a tender buyback where everyone, including actually promoters, tender it? You see, what, what whatever is uh, 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 normally practiced is what has been uh, will be discussed by the board. I think uh, the matter is with the board on 18th, which is which will really discuss in terms of the buyback. Uh, so I would like to reserve my comments and then come back uh, clearly on 18th with a very detailed uh, view after the board approves that. Sure. The only advice I would say here is that to actually do it as an opener, market buyback, which will also give some degree of a confidence that, 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 that this isn't a cheaper form of dividend and that the promoters are actually directly and directly uh, 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 looking to effectively increase the stake through the company. That's my only advice. Thank yeah, you. I, I, thank you, sir. I think I'll take your input and definitely this will be provided as a summary back to the board in terms of uh, considering it actively, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Anyone who would like to ask a question, you may press star and one. The next question is from the line of Dinesh Mystery from Investor First Advisor. Please go ahead. Hello, hi, sir. Uh, good evening, and uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, so I had uh, uh, my first question is on the other expenses, which is there. You know, it's about 40 crores this year. So this quarter, so uh, one you have mentioned clearly, it's, a, it's on account of some legal expenses, which is this is three and a half, which you said it's non-recurring. But outside of that, what could be the other drivers uh, for the increase in other expenses? Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, if you look at, we have spent uh, a little bit portion in terms of advertising, marketing, and sales promotion, which I explained in my uh, previous question to the gentleman, is one mm -hmm. thing. They, uh, there has been, uh, uh, which you have covered it up in terms of legal professional, uh, is one of the major drivers. Mm -hmm. The other major driver is that in terms of the software license cost marginally moving up, I would say that uh, because of uh, the cloud-based uh, cost and then the number of people moving up, and also we have moved up in terms of uh, trying to automate the HR as a solution in terms of uh, 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 success factors. So. That is one cost which we have reinvested back. I think uh, these three will be the major drivers which is running through in the other costs. Yeah. Got it. But uh, this legal expense which is there, you mentioned there was a medical issue. But uh, was it uh, was it impacting any of our customers or what? And you know, and uh, you mentioned it is one time. Is there any other part of the other expenses which is one time, or do we assume that going forward it will be a 35 crore kind of uh, uh, expense item in our PNL? Uh, if you look at it, that we are trying to look at uh, uh, in terms of uh, you can assume safely at about 35 crores, but we are trying to look at it in terms of optimizing each and every uh, area of expenses, uh, whatever is happening, even in a smaller way. For example, uh, um, being a peer, and uh, uh, we have been very cautiously uh, providing for certain bad debts, uh, which uh, mm -hmm. in, in actual parlance, for example, we have as a policy that anything on 90 days and above we try to provide it, but I think we get. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, uh, 100th day or whatever it is, that is that is what we are trying to bring that in discipline in terms of trying to bring it in so that even the provisions doesn't happen. Uh, similarly, on every other cost, for example, post this uh, Jan of March, we have negotiated with the landlord where we are today. And we have asked for, we have got one month rent free, which has come through very clearly on this. The one month rent free is a, is a cost again, which is translating about a crore of rupees or so. I think smaller pieces, what we are trying to see is that, which we are trying to look at it. While your assumption may be right, uh, second thing is in terms of the legal cost affecting the customers, I think we have taken a complete uh, uh, control over the entire set of customers. I, we can make a statement that uh, in with Srikanth, Vinayan, Raghu, everyone else around that, we have not lost a single customer in terms of all this uh, fiasco. Uh, all we have done also is that while we have covered the entire major set of clients, which is uh, in person uh, 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 by, by multiple uh, personalities within the company, uh, in terms of about uh, the senior management tapping up all the uh, clients out and then uh, trying to explain the issues, which should be about 100 plus clients. We have also sent communic across to the, all the clients out very clearly, re detailing, and uh, we have got even assurances from the client saying that, look, we are going to be, we are extremely happy. Uh, that is one of the reasons we have got a client satisfaction survey in terms of 3.9 out of 4, and all of them have continued to stay with us, and that is what is seen basically that the top uh, uh, 20 clients contributing uh, uh, such revenue and top 70 clients contributing about 70% uh, uh, of the revenue running through. So we are pretty confident and there is no issues which we can tell you. Got it. So this three and a half crores is paid to the lawyers or is paid to the clients for some damages? These are paid to the lawyers. We don't need to pay to any client for any damage because we are in the business basically, the testing of the business uh, in the quality assurance side, we don't assume any kind of a damage out. Got it. Detailed audit, which uh, one includes a detailed audit, detailed audit by the legal team, and uh, in terms of discovering the laptop and things like that, plus uh, lawyer and other representation fees. Got it, sir. And sir, uh, just to understand more on the uh, on your uh, this uh, contract of cost, you know, if you are, if I want to see utilization, it is offset on uh, on site is about almost ninety six percent. So is that the reason why our contractor costs are going up? And if so, how are we trying to kind of control it, given where our utilization rate is? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a good question. So I just wanted to uh, give you but, uh, uh, what you call, this being a one-off year, basically, we thought that, see, the fear of pandemic killed everyone. The fear of pandemic, uh, one, as a psychology, either it killed in terms of either sulking on your business 
personally sulk yourself or try to fight and get back clearly Correct. i think we did the second part in terms of fighting and getting back in terms of seeing that how best we had a two reasons probably hmm. people may not agree with it one is that a pandemic which everybody know about it second is that we had the disturbances in the entire sales and delivery team where people tried to moving out very clearly to back this out very clearly we thought that we need to go ahead and accept and we cannot turn down any customer which is all the value addition in terms of the efforts what we have sent and we don't want a branding that we have lost the client on account of non execution so we thought that the best way out is that even if i can afford a little bit in terms of losing the margin and trying to execute the contract we can stabilize there are accounts which we have started 6 months back with about 25% gross margin where through contractors and we have hired them within a condition that we will make them as a full time employee and they are becoming a full time employee effective april which means that the margins are bouncing back we have reworked those margins on a step by step basis by about 200 to 300 basis point to get that back and if we speak we have done that very clearly on a large accounts so that is one of the psychological reasons to assure ourselves yes and also to send a signal to the market and also a signal to the detractors that yes we are not going to be bowed down by any kind of non fulfillment so with the challenges in the market in terms of the resourcing with the challenges in the market in terms of the available pool we have no other options but to go into the contractor but if you look at it in terms of the current set of mindset of the employees whether it is on site or offshore most of them are willing to take a job directly as a contractor as against a full time this is the issue faced by many of the companies which is on the it side because with working from home they get the flexibility completely and they wanted definitely to work as a contractor unfortunately only fiduciary positions like a ceo cfo or cmo or whatever it is i think these guys can never opt for that but i think rest of the technical folks today enjoy that so these are the reasons clearly we are definitely debating why i can tell you that two things that if my business get into a non linearity mode to a certain major extent which is a long term uh, strategy this can the dependency on the people will come down two is that you know, as i move into my digital transformation in terms of through the consulting route probably the non linearity will come in the third portion is that if i even out my growth not to go for a crazy 40 50% growth and try to look at it on my size in terms of a 25% growth or 30% sub 30% marginal growth i think i'll be able to balance it out in terms of the predictable technologies where i am operating out clearly so we, we, we it's a process sir i can't assure that in one quarter things are going to change it's a process and we are working on the process got it sir and sir one uh, one just uh, so one small question for me sir our short term borrowings have gone up about 16 crores to 47 crores now uh, uh, so you know how are we at it obviously we are funding some some working capital in it and uh, how do we tie this in with the acquisition of apara that we are going to make of 4.8 million plus the buyback that we are uh, you know kind of contemplating uh, you know how would our balance sheet look like after all these uh, things especially on the cash and debt side sir yes my lord i have i have cash cash equivalents investments and mutual funds all put together as of 31st march approximately about 240 crores plus i have used my cash credit in usa and uk uk comes to me at about 1.8% us comes to me at about 3.2% and india comes to me at about 6.2% there has been some obligation except for us and uk in india to use that limit in terms of trying to show a month and balance to at least start looking at renewals and the whole idea of renewing this 25 crores limit is essential we thought that if you go for really some expansion you get a cheaper source of credit clearly while it is so while the fund available is at about close to 240 crores we could have always spend that out and saved on the nominal interest cost which we have been spending we have been trying to look at it on a daily basis in terms of serving out because my average return on the 220 crores or 230 crores is yielding at about close to 6 and up to 7% which in the overall market which i am trying to look at it net net i do understand that there are some taxation component we are also eliminating the taxation and trying to do it so i don't see that utilization of the limit is an issue so net net if you look at it 200 crores on the apara digital i can talk about on an all cash deal of 4.8 million i think the payout is going to be about close to 3 million which is going to happen in the next 60 days and then rest of the 1.8 million over a period of 24 months uh, on a on out basis subject uh, based on the financial projections given by them achieving that with a trigger and also the ebitda which uh, they have committed out very clearly so that is going to be earn out based on the earnings what they have made out and uh, i don't see anything uh, hitting out what it calls for in terms of the balance sheet how it looks out very clearly is that 
it's about close to 25 crores even if you look at it on 80 rupees so in two months time which is too optimist uh, too pessimistic but i think at about 75 rupees on 3 million we should be spending out about close to 23 24 crores which is not going to affect me the second portion is that i have a net asset equaling to about close to a million dollar coming there out from there and uh, the rest will remain in goodwill in terms of what we are providing out and the payable will be at about uh, 1.8 million which is 24 months down the line this is what is in terms of the balance sheet Got it, sir. And sir, last thing, sir, we had an SEIS benefit of 9.7 crores, which we have reversed. Is there any more such reversals expected, or this was the last? And was uh, it in this yeah. quarter or last quarter? Because we have mentioned as a 31st March, but not so clear. Uh, no, no. We are talking on a year-on-year -year comparison. That is one of the reasons we put it in the investor note. If I had removed that 9.7 crores and if I had removed the legal cost, I would have done an EBITDA at about 11.5 percent for the whole year. Is what the justification we yes. tried to give. But I think this was this was done in the last quarter, not in oh, this but quarter. This is done. There is no more provisioning that we need to do, right? On on the SEIS part. Sir, 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 I just want to make a statement very clearly. The total SEIS uh, uh, received by us is about close to 6 crores. The total SEIS receivable by us is at about 21 crores. The total 27 crores is under review by the DGFT central government in terms of a special panel to look at it as to why, what is this testing, what needs to be done and we have submitted all of our arguments currently looks favorable. While it is so, basically, we also have admitted as a contingent liability on this 27 crores out over there, saying that what government decides out very clearly because there are well-settled case laws and instances which has allowed for the testing company and we don't have any issues. What was reversed for 9 crores was the company, company based on opinion from legal experts, availed for the year 2019-20 for which a notification came backdated saying that not allowed, so we are duty-bound to really go ahead and reverse that. Got it, sir. Got it. So basically, there is another 18 crores, but that will, will not get reversed anytime soon. Uh -huh. ah, absolutely. Got it. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone who would like to ask a question, you may press star and one. The next question is from the line of Keshav Gang from PPIPL. Please go ahead. Sir, I want to understand why the promoter shareholding has reduced by 3.5% last quarter. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, see, uh, uh, the promoters have secured erstwhile personally some loans. <coughs> they have, on good faith, pledged a security shares invariably to settle that with the optimism that these loans will be settled out and the shares will be reverted back. As we say in the market in terms of the pricing probably, and uh, the shares have been uh, the pledge has been executed by the uh, the, the pledgee and then, sorry, pledge or a pledgee and uh, uh, whatever uh, is that. So while uh, we are, they are in talks with them saying that basically to arrange for an agreed installment settlement to really uh, get the shares back. But I think it's a discussion going on, but as a part of corporate governance, as it moved out of the DP, we need to necessarily file that out and that is what a filing has been made and that is purely the reason. It is not an open market sale. In fact, it is a uh, uh, tax negative in terms of not suffering STT and selling out very clearly, which nobody would do. While it is so, they have been trying to do in terms of see what best can be done to really increase their uh, share by buying out. But this still talk and negotiations are on very clearly. Okay, sir. So, so basically what I understood that the sale has not been made, it's just a technicality and uh, I mean it can still be reversed. It's Absolutely. Absolutely. So that is very reassuring. And sir, also you have started paying dividends in the past two years. The balance sheet is uh, balance sheet is excellent, and on top of that, you are considering a share buyback also. So, so that is very heartening for all the shareholders. So I just wanted to add what the previous speaker said that the ideal buyback is open market buyback, wherein the promoters are not uh, participating. So that increases the confidence of the minority shareholders even further. Uh, and uh, so also in that kind of buyback, the company has a great deal of flexibility to acquire shares. And I mean, so long as it is below the uh, price determined for buyback. So uh, actually, actually, the cost of acquisition is uh, is quite low. So, but even if you are not doing that, and if you are going for a tender offer, sir, then my only request is not to keep too high a premium. So like our share is at around 420 rupees. So, so then you can consider a, a buyback at not higher than 500 rupees. 
So because the idea being that so that the company can maximize the number of shares that it can buy back and extinguish, so the earning per share can increase even higher. Sir, uh, but if you will uh, do a share buyback at thousand rupees, so then uh, hardly a very small number of shares will be able to be bought back and extinguished. So EPS will not increase uh, by that large an extent. So, so that was a very humble request, which you can kindly consider. And so, lastly, just wanted to understand so that have we seen the worst in terms of margins, or you think that there is still a possibility of further uh, expenses uh, going up? higher than the uh, revenue uh, uh, absolutely we uh, uh, i mean absolutely we have seen the worst with confidence we can say very clearly that uh, we as a business to survive and as a business to move up basically uh, we are already at the inflex point of the parabolic inverted parabolic curve and we know for sure that we are going to move up but i think we'll demonstrate and come back and give the numbers and then talk about it very clearly but uh, coming back to the buyback what you have said gentlemen i think we'll take all your feedback and we'll put it out but we wanted to reassure on behalf of the promoters is that they have categorically made clear that they are not going to surrender even a single share in this entire buyback and they are not going to participate in the buyback in terms of trying to surrender the share so it is for 100% sure that promoters do not want to sell any share the intent is very clear to see that how this can be enhanced in terms of by acquiring more shares so, but in terms of the other suggestions given by you, in terms of the methodology, these are valid inputs, sir. Absolutely, we'll summarize and put it across to the board. So, thank you very much and best of luck. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you may press star and one to ask a question at this time. <coughs> the next question is from the line of Surbhi Saraugi from Smith Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Hello, am I audible? Yes, yes. Sir, just one question. Can you throw some light on your acquisition of Apara Digital? What are your expectations from this acquisition? Sure. So, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, the intent of the acquisition is uh, we as a company, we have been on a path to achieve uh, 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 we are we as a company are wanting to go beyond quality engineering and become a digital assurance and an engineering services company digital engineering services company in line with that thinking we have acquired this company round square services beyond the quality engineering capabilities in the areas of data uh, analytics ai and ml so we intend to leverage these capabilities take them to our existing clientele uh, use our relationships and uh, deepen deepen the relationships with our clients and expand the wallet share. So that is really the intent of the acquisition. We have been investing into digital engineering services for the past 18 months. Uh, Dignity by itself has more than 100 resources uh, in this space, and we've been servicing, uh, uh, you know, offerings such as cloud migration, uh, RPA, and so on. And to add to those services, now we will have additional capabilities in the area areas of data engineering, analytics. Um, and to add the add to that, uh, Round Square also has uh, uh, a platform, an AI-based, an active learning AI-based platform called Zastra, which is a data annotation platform at this point in time, but can be used uh, for several use cases beyond what this company is doing with our existing clientele, such as medical devices, um, insurance, and so on. And just a moment. Uh, just to add to what uh, Srikant said, uh, the platform also has the capability to do uh, what we call the model validation. Every enterprise operationalizes its AI implementation, even as a digital assurance company, that gives us a very unique edge. Productionalizing AI models requires ML validation, and this platform has the capabilities to do that. So in that sense, it also complements our uh, assurance capabilities, apart from laying a very firm footage in terms of uh, upselling our ability to do a data-first uh, digital transformation, uh, which is a very selective and specialized thing that uh, we are forging ahead. So that's the intent with which, uh, as, as Srikanth and Krishnan outlined, the board approved this acquisition. Okay, okay, got it, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone who would like to ask a question, you may press star and one. 
The next question is from the line of Keshav Kar from PPIPL. Please go ahead. Sir, since 85% of our revenues are coming from America, and sir, you would know that recently the uh, bond uh, yield curve is inverted in the U.S. market, so which basically is a predictor of a recession, and typically after 12 to 18 months of yield inverting, the recession sets in. So, so in that case, uh, sir, what kind of demand outlook is there? And uh, sir, uh, you think that uh, we can get hit from a, a possible recession in America? Vinay, can you take this question? Yeah. So um, thanks for the question. So yeah, I, I actually mentioned uh, when I was giving my commentary that uh, business transformation which actually started during the pandemic. Uh, that is something which is continuing. Most. uh most customers actually whom we have talked to they are definitely approaching the market very cautiously uh, as you rightly mentioned uh, so therefore from an overall spending perspective there is definitely a a a downward curve if you will uh, however uh, their spend on the business transformation particularly in the digital engineering area is something continuing so they will continue to spend in in these areas the other thing which is actually very favorable to us is that as long as they continue on the digital transformation uh, transformation journey there is an assurance partner required someone you know someone who is uh, going to make sure that uh, the goals and objectives which which uh, for which they started this entire journey is met uh, both from function and features perspective but also reliability performance and security perspective so uh, yes uh, you know if 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 you check uh, uh, all the uh, services companies actually are giving a very cautiously optimistic outlook but as of now uh, based on what i have seen with our customer base uh, we are not seeing a demand going down to the place where it will start concerning us uh, i think there is a still a fairly large market and demand which is, you know which uh, can give us our desired uh, growth objective sir and uh, uh, sir whom would you consider our uh, closest peer in the indian market i mean uh, which company well uh, yeah, from a from a overall uh, overall competitiveness perspective every every large company actually competes with us however uh, uh, our positioning of providing quality engineering services and and combined with uh, digital engineering capabilities uh, is something which is very unique uh, so uh, the size and competency and the depth of competency if you look at uh, which is what is is very attractive to the customers i mentioned right in the beginning that uh, most customers actually are looking at uh, boutique solution providers best of breed solutions actually who understand a particular function or a service fairly well and and from that perspective i think we are uh, we are really positioned well but it is very competitive everyone you know when you take uh, any large tier 1 or tier 2 company they do have this portfolio of service uh, uh, however it is part of their larger portfolio which uh, not necessarily is attractive to many of the customers so basically why i was uh, trying to understand what i was trying to understand is that sir, if we look at our operating margin and even if we consider 11 and a half percent operating margin uh, excluding all the one off items so still that is half of the industry average which is around uh, over 20% so so then uh, what the reason if we are i mean similar to the other companies our business if it is similar then why are our margins so low Question you want to take? Yeah, I'll take it, Vinay, very clearly. I think uh, while uh, what Vinay said in terms of the businesses, basically as to why pretty much all the Indian companies are uh, comparable companies when you look at it, but I think their margins will be on the higher side basically because they come with a combination of one in terms of the size, which gives them a leverage. Two, they also have a uh, predominantly there are SI players, incidentally coupled with. Uh, Uh, the uh, uh, testing on the digital. While well, we look at it in terms of our 168 million, I think predominantly we are testing <laughs> very, very, very clearly. So, on an apple-to-apple comparison, probably is that an independent testing services company 
could be just for the metric sake in terms of what the business does, or you have to take the division within the any of the big SIs or whatever it is. It could be Accenture, uh, Wipro, Infosys, whatever it is. You have to look at only their testing as a division clearly and compare their numbers in terms of their right comparison clearly. But otherwise, if you look at it, and may not be the right method to compare the 11 and a percent, I'm telling, I, we are admitting very clearly that uh, the uh, overing margins, which you have, were around uh, 15 to 16 percent, and we are trying to improve that to so close to about 18 percent as it moves up over a period of time is what is a wishful thinking. The optimism is that, but I think that is a comparable thing. So if you have to look at industry as an average, clearly when the industry operates 20 to 22, probably the testing companies will operate anywhere between 17 to 19 or so, uh, which could be depending on the size. So uh, we are, as a company, transforming very clearly. One, we are trying to transform into an outcome business from a, a pure time and uh, material, pure play, uh, nominal testing. We have evolved from a uh, uh, quality uh, uh, assurance to a quality engineering company. From quality engineering, we are trying to convert into a digital assurance. In digital assurance, we are now trying to get into a digital transformation company as an added line of business. As we continue to add things, probably we'll age to that. That is a five-year roadmap which we have. So this 11.5 percent for the one year today, this is not the year for my comparison with respect to any of the thing, and uh, it has to be isolated and looked at. I hope to have clarified. Sure, sir. sir. So basically, shareholders uh, shouldn't uh, basically take uh, the operating margin of FY22 as a benchmark. Should consider it as a more of a, uh, a one-off kind of margin. And our stable, steady state margin should be around 15%. Is that correct? Absolutely. Okay, sir. So thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you may press star and one to ask a question at this time. <laughs> As there are no further questions from the participants, I now hand the conference over to Mr. Shrikan Chakilam for closing comments. Thank, <coughs> thank you, everyone, for uh, your participation and your questions. Uh, your, your feedback will be uh, taken and incorporated. Uh, as much as we can, and we'll take some of your other feedback to the board as well in terms of considering the considerations for the buyback. Uh, look forward to uh, the next con call, and uh, we'll give you further updates about the company. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of Signity Technologies Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines.